Father, we thank and we honor you today. God, King of glory, what an awesome wonder you are. Thank you for this grace and the opportunity just to be you know, in your presence and to read your word. What a gift this is, King of glory. And we appreciate, we say thank you, Jehovah Father, for your steadfast love and your mercies that you've shown upon us, King of glory. Lord, we thank you that even in our, in our weaknesses, through your word, you make us strong. So, Father, I pray today, even as we come into the conclusion of the first book of Corinthians, or the first letter of Paul to the church in Corinth, the King of glory, a lot of us will be strengthened in their inner man, that they shall move from faith to faith, from glory to glory, for the glory and the honor of your holy name. In Jesus' name we do trust, pray, and believe. Amen. Once again, welcome as we come to the conclusion of the 46th book of the Bible, which is the first episode of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Today we'll be reading from verses, uh, from chapters number 15, sorry, through to chapters number 16. Chapters number 15, the Apostle Paul is trying to speak or trying to command, you know, uh, teach the, uh, the, the people in Corinth in regards of putting their hopes in the Lord Jesus Christ and is tackling the issue of resurrection so that the people, the believers in the church of Corinth should put their faith in that, in that fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected and that there is life after death and they shall be indeed resurrection. And we shall see, uh, you know, let us see what the Bible have as to teach us today in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So the Apostle Paul is telling them, you know, as the gospel has just in, in its simplest form and in its pure form, as he brought it to them, you know, he's telling them that I hope that you're still putting your faith in what I taught or in what I preached in your presence. Because if you then do, don't do that, then your believing shall be in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died, uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. In other words, they are still alive up to now. But some have fallen asleep or are, or are dead. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And then verses 8, he says, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of a due time. Something very important. And remember the apostle Paul, is ten, ten, is, he has been a speaking to the church in Corinth, writing to them and telling them that he's just an apostle as, as, as the rest. And this fact that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him is a very significant, you know, a testimony in the life of the apostle Paul to the, to, to the people in Corinth or also to the Gentiles at large. Because most of them, they thought that Paul was not a true apostle for the very fact that he never walked with Christ when he was alive. Not like John or Bartholomew or like, Bartholomew or like Matthew or, no, uh, you know, the life of Mark, you know, it's it's not like that. For them, they thought that actually just being an apostle is being, you know, person who was next to Christ and walking with them, with, with, with him. And you know, the apostle, the name apostle actually means a sent one. That's what it means. The apostle is. It's only that in our days that we take. You know the the titles far beyond you know what what they're supposed to be but an apostle is a sent one is a person who has been sent so the apostle paul tells them yes the lord in due time he also appeared to me and we've read that story in the uh, uh you know uh in in acts chapter number nine the dramatic divine encounter that the apostle paul had with the lord jesus christ let me bring something here to attention. Verses 3 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. A man cannot give what they have not received. You know, the Apostle Paul tells them, the revelation that I came with, 
You know, the revelation that I preached in your midst, it is also a revelation that I received. And this is the testimonies that you have concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there are people, and he mentions them, you know, uh, all through to Peter or to Cephas, that, that is actually Peter, and to James. James here, it, 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 it's actually, you know, uh, uh, the brother, I believe, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells them, listen, these people have met him. These people were with him. Christ resurrected. And after his death, he appeared, you know, after resurrection, he appeared to those who were around and he mentions them. And then he says, and lastly, he appeared to me also. Something very, very important I want to say is this. You cannot give what you do not have. And you do not, you cannot say you have unless you have received. The things of God are given, and He chooses whom He is going to give. And you cannot stand up by yourself and just start declaring all, you know, uh, things alter scatter. There, there will not be any impact. The things that we give out, the gospel that we give out, it is a gospel that we preach. I am here preaching to you because I was also preached to by someone else. I am here winning souls and teaching the word of God because somebody else taught the word, preached the word, and he won me over into the kingdom of God. It is through that. And you know, and this is what I always ask people, even in our church, I ask them, how many people will stand at the end of the day? How many people will stand when all comes, you know, to, to the judgment seat? How many people will enter heaven because you had a part to play to make them enter heaven? You know, that's how God has designed this kingdom to be, that those who have received, they freely give. Those who have received, they take the responsibility to preach the gospel to those who haven't yet heard. So I'm encouraging you this day, before this day comes to an end, or before this week comes to an end, Today is on a Sunday. Before this, before next Sunday, please take some time this week and speak to someone concerning the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look for an opportunity. Tell the Holy Spirit to help you, and indeed it shall help you to become a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ to those that are around you. Verses uh, 9, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He's not worthy to be called an apostle because he feels not that I didn't walk with Christ, not that I'm not a true apostle like Cephas or all that. He says, I don't deserve to be called an apostle because of my past life. You know, the way I live, the way I persecuted the church, he says, yeah, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. It is by the mercies of God. It is by the grace of God, the undeserving favor of God. There is nothing that Paul did for Christ to honor him the way he honored him. He just obeyed the call and he continued to move on as an apostle. And the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed his messages with signs, wonders, and miracles. So he says, it's only by the grace of God I am what I am. His grace towards me was not in vain. In other words, you can see the results of the grace of God in my life. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. What here the Apostle Paul is saying is this, that listen, grace is not an excuse to diligence. Grace does not... You know, grace, grace does not exempt you from being diligent or working hard. Actually, grace comes in your life to be able to work hard. You know, when you pray, you don't pray that just things can be easy, but you pray to access the grace to do what seems to be humanly impossible. So Paul says, it is by the grace of God that I am diligent the way I am diligent, preaching all those missionary journeys that he did, the beatings that he received, the churches that he planted, the books that he wrote, it is all because of grace and is the grace of God in his life was not in vain. It has results up to today. So don't sit and say, oh, grace, grace is there. You know, things are easy. Grace gives you, gives you the enablement, the divine enablement to do what you could not do naturally. So Paul says it is by the grace of God that I'm diligent in the manner of which I am diligent. But therefore, verses 11, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. In other words, it was a partnership, and it is God who sent all of us. We just preach, and God, through the Holy Spirit, helped you to believe. Verses 12. Now, if Christ is preached, 
uh, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, Paul begins now to tackle the issue of resurrection because there are a lot of people who are, you know, who are, who are peddling this uh, uh, wrong doctrine or teaching that... Um, you know, you should not have any hope. Life is only now. Live the way you will live. There is no life after death, neither shall there be any resurrection after, after you die. So Paul is telling them, if Christ, listen, he says this, if Christ he, he, he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If Christ was not risen, then our preaching, like we are doing right now, it is in vain and the faith that we have is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are we are uh, in this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, why should you have? You know, uh, why should you put your faith in, in someone or something that never existed, you know, that never happened? Then if that's the way we are living, if, if that's, if you're putting hope in somebody that did not resurrect, then we should be pitied. We are a sorry case. But that's not so. Continues. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul is telling us here that the reason, uh, you know, after Christ was, is risen from the dead, he has opened the door. It's like the first fruit. He has tasted. He's the one who's showing us that, you know what, it is possible and that those who have fallen asleep, you know, they'll also come back alive. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For, is, for, for as in Adam all die, that is in sin, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, and the uh, uh, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he puts an end to all uh, to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Hallelujah! He must put all his enemies under his feet and the last of them all we shall see it is death the last enemy that will be destroyed is death for he has put all things under his feet but when he says all things are put under him it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted is ex is expect is expect is accepted now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. In other words, everything will rotate and come back to its origin. Remember the scripture tells us in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. And so out of God, everything else came into existence. And when all is said and done, the circle shall again go back to him and God shall be all in all. 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with the beasts of at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's a quote that if you have watched, you know, uh, medieval movies, yeah, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of warriors have used that uh, term. You know, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, when they saw, when the, when the, 
these people so that they, they cannot win a battle, that they have fought their best. And, you know, to, uh, and the next day when they're going to fight, it's as if, you know, they're going to lose. They'll just say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. In other words, there is no hope. Let us just eat and drink for even if we don't eat and drink, tomorrow we'll just die. So Paul is using that, you know, in a rhetoric manner. And he's saying, he's saying what? I fought the beast of Ephesus. What advantage is it to me? And you know what happened to Paul while, while he was at Ephesus? You know, the kind of beating, you know, that he received, uh, you know, because of proclaiming the gospel and setting a certain, uh, you know, lady free. So he says, then... Why, why, why are we living like this? Why are we being persecuted? Why are we living such a life, a pathetic life, you know, in quotes, you know? Uh, why, 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 why should we live as if we are people who are dying daily? Every day, any single day that comes, you know, for the early church, every single day that came, it meant that they can die. They can be arrested, they can be killed, they can be stoned. You know, and we've, 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 we've seen it as we are reading, you know, the gospel, uh, the, the book of Acts of the Apostles. And so Paul is saying then, why should we be, you know, uh, be so patient in our tribulations and the things that you're facing? Then why don't we just say like all other people say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die meaning there is no hope. If we die, we die. And that's the end of it. There is no resurrection. There is no life after death. When you die, you die. You go back to the soil, the maggots eat you, and that's the end of you. But that's not the story. Verses 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with which body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not, uh, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of an animal, another of fish, and another of birds. There, there are also celestial bodies and, ter uh, and, terrestri and, and terrestrial bodies. By the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory or in brightness. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, that is, in decay. It is raised in, in corruption or in glory. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is what? A spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being and the last man and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ has become a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was, was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are all are those who are made of dust, as as uh, as as is the heavenly man. So also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. You know, Christ is... Sorry. Uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, do you know what? Some people say that if there is resurrection after death, so what kind of body will we have? And you can't... You know, Paul is, is saying, you know, you foolish, you know. <laughs> you foolish one. You know, he's so harsh to them... But in the level of revelation they had, even if you just take a lay person who does not understand the scriptures, who does not know things pertaining resurrection, and they have seen people die, they have seen um, animals die, like when there is famine or an accident, you can go and see, you know, a dog hit by a car and it's thrown, you know, just uh, 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 at, at the gutters, just, uh, uh, you know, at the roadside, and after some time it decays, it smells, and all of a sudden it just disintegrates. So when somebody looks at that, or if somebody is dead, 
they are buried and something happens, they have to be exhumed. You know, this person has decayed. They are all bones and after some time, even the bones, you know, uh, 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 begin to become, you know, uh, uh, brittle. And um, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot judge this person harshly because their level of thinking by in regards of what they have seen natural cause of events occurring you know they see how a body dies how it decays and the flesh is gone and then the bones are there and then you tell me that this person who's a bone shall again resurrect but then you ask in what form shall this person resurrect and this <laughs> this question makes paul a little bit mad and he says foolish one don't you know when things are sown they come back in a different form you know, we shall sow, the body shall be corruptible, it shall come out incorruptible. And the point is just this. Paul is trying to say, leave it to God. The, when, the, when it is a resurrection, it will be a glorious one. We shall not come in the same form. We shall not come in the same form of decay. We shall not be those that decay. We shall not be those who are given to, in, to, to, to corruption. You know, we shall be holy. We shall be glorious. The body that we shall receive, it shall be a glorious body. So stop asking, you know, uh, what kind of body shall you have? Will it be gold? Will it be silver? Will it be shining? Will it be dull? Will it be white? Will it be... Leave that to God. But when the resurrection happens... Be assured, it is going to be in a better form than what we are currently. Praise be the name of the living God. Verses 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corrupt, corruptible must, uh, must, must put on incorruption and this mortal must, must put on immortal. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and the mortal has put on immoral, I, 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 immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So right here we see Paul uh, beginning to mention about the rapture that will occur. And he says, now this I say, brethren, that the flesh, uh, um, verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. So the, 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 the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ or the rapture is a mystery. We shall not all we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know, those who are dead in the times of um, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are dead in Christ, they shall be given a new form. Those who are alive and not dead, they'll also be given a new form. Remember, we said this, in the days of the Apostle Paul and the early church, the way they lived, they lived as though, you know, there is a, uh, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was just a couple of months or years, you know, uh, uh, just away or a few decades, you know, to come. And they really believe that they're coming to see because the way they preached the gospel to their known world then, they knew that the end is coming because the Lord Jesus Christ said, this gospel shall be preached to the end of the earth and then the end shall come. So Paul is talking to, to the Corinthians in such a manner to understand understand that listen those who have died in Christ they'll be given a new form and those who are still alive and they're still in Christ they'll also be given a new form either way whatever happens when you're coming to reign in with Christ we shall have a different form verses 55 oh death where is your sting oh heads where is your victory the sting of death is a sin and the strength of sin is the law Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who are in Christ will have victory over death. Will have victory over sin. In fact, right now, you that you are born again, you already are living a life in victory over a sin. You are in living a life in victory over the death that is brought about by sin. Verses 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Underline that. Verses 58, I repeat, therefore, then in what light are you going to live? Now, because you know that you shall, you shall, you shall experience resurrection, how then will you live? That's why it says, therefore. Therefore, my beloved, in the light of that, revelation. 
be steadfast, number one. Be immovable. Do not be shaken. Do not be tossed around with any wind of doctrine that comes. Don't lose hope because of what is wrongly taught. So don't be immovable. Always abounding. Always abounding. In what? In the work of the Lord. In the work of the Lord. This is the way that those who are born again, those who know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior, the Apostle Paul says, if you believe in the resurrection of the dead, if you believe in the rapture, if you believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then live this way. Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the service or in the work of the Lord. You're listening to me. This is the question. Where are you serving? Where are you serving? How are you serving the Lord? How are you serving the Lord? How are you binding in his work? For he says this, for your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Every labor has a reward. Every labor you offer to God has a reward. Don't let the enemy treat you know cheat you. Any labor you do with a clear motive and out of revelation, it is a labor that has a reward. And I pray for you today. Those of you who are serving God and you want to give up, let the spirit of Paul that is writing this letter with be upon you. That you shall not you shall not give up. You shall be steadfast. You shall be immovable. Uh, you know. Uh, you know. Movable, and you shall continue to serve the Lord regardless of the experiences you're seeing. Why? Because the scripture teaches you and me that those who labor and are serving in the Lord, they're not doing that in vain. Praise be the name of the living God. There is a reward both here on earth and in the life to come. So keep on serving God. If you're not serving God, I call you into serving God in the name of Jesus Christ. Verses six, chapter 16, verses 1. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. Look at that language. It says, you must do. In other words, I command you to give. I command you to give. You must give. That, that's the way I've commanded the church in Galatians. I want you to give. And you know, Galatians and Corinthians, these two churches, Paul really labored. When you come to read uh, Galatians in a couple of days, you shall see Paul labored. You know, what was ailing uh, Corinthians was also ailing the church in Galatia. And so Paul is saying, as I commanded Galatia, I also command you, prepare an offering that when I come, I may, I may receive it and take it down to Jerusalem. You shall see. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. That is the command. You know, a lot of people think about what they're going to give, you know, as an offering on that Sunday morning. Or, or during the service. Oh, so what do I... Do I have any pocket change here? Let me see. Let me see. Paul says, no, don't live like that. Let your giving be a planned giving. When the first day of the week, begin to think, what am I going to give? The Lord speak to me. You know, uh, one of my spiritual fathers said this, that it is on Sunday where believers lose a lot of money. Why? Because they're giving out of, without understanding. They're giving without revelation. They're just giving by the impulse. They're just giving by, as by the way, your giving should be thought out. When you're coming to give, it should be a thought out process. Father, what offering do you want me to bring? You see, God was so cautious in the Old Testament to teach you that he does not just take anything. God does not take anything. God instructed for this sin bring this. For this, bring that. Just to show you how he takes seriousness, the issue of sacrifices and offerings, you know. And you should not just go and say, this is what I'm going at. And today I feel like giving this. No. The way you pray for a job, the way you prayed for a car, the way you prayed for God to use, the way you prayed for, you know, uh, uh, for, for different stuff in your life, in the same manner, prepare before God. In a mood of prayer, prepare what you're going to give. Don't just give because people are giving. That will not honor God, but, a th but an offering that you've thought through, an offering that you've meditated, an offering that you've battled, and you say, this is what I'm going to give. And I'll look for it until I give it, or I'll keep it until you know I come to give in the house of the Lord. That is the offering that the Lord will accept. 
when I come that uh, store up as uh, uh, and he says each on the week of of you lay something aside storing up as he may prosper that means give in the same manner as the Lord has enabled you to prosper let your giving be related with your income not that you're you <laughs> that 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 you are blessed you know, you have a big income and your giving is low. Or even don't struggle so much to give when you can't make ends meet. Ask God, God, how what am I going to give? And let the Lord speak to you. Don't let, you know, we are living in a day where people have to be coerced to give. And that's not the spirit of the scripture. The spirit of the, uh, the, spirit of the scripture is this. As the Lord has blessed you, as the Lord has caused you to prosper, also reciprocate in your giving in the same manner. So if your prosperity increases, let also your giving increase. That there may be no collections when I come, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Now, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you in the, if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. He says, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And, T and if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, because Timothy was, a, was quite a young man. Send him journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him, uh, to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Underline that. Watch, in other words, be alert. Stand fast in faith. Do not shake your faith. Make a clear decision that you're going to live by faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with the spirit of love. Let love be your motive. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanas that is in the first fruit of Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanas, for uh, uh, for Tunatas and uh, and Akai and, and Akaikas, for they uh, for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men who refresh others. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord. With the church that is in their house, all the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. He finishes with that. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. After such a rebuke, after such instructions, after detailed ways in regards to worship and handling you know, services in the church, the Apostle Paul finishes with a attitude of love. He's telling them, do you know what? My love, uh, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's telling them, listen, I'm writing to you the things that I've written. They may be harsh, but they are coming out of a spirit of love. It is because I love you. And that's, you know, the heart of every pastor. That's the heart, you know, for, for every preacher. That you're not preaching from a point of condemning men, but you're preaching from a, from a point of love. Instructing people to live in the way that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to live. Remember, the Apostle Paul says, My children in whom I labor until Christ is formed in you. There is a lot of work that goes on, you know, to shape the believers to be what God God wants them to be. And without the spirit of love, we will never succeed. 
As we conclude, let us look at verses number 8. Chapter 16, he says, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. I want us to finish with this note, because the Apostle Paul is telling the church in Corinth, Listen, I want to come to you, but I'm in Ephesus. A great door has opened here, but I've got very, very many adversaries. That's why, you know, he quotes here and he says, After fighting the beast of Ephesus, that in verses, uh, chapter, verses 32, he's telling the church, Church, can you please stand with me? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ taught us, Pray this manner, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's a prayer for spiritual warfare, right there in the Lord's prayer. You know, your kingdom come, you're praying that the kingdom of God will continue to prosper and to progress. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ said when Peter, you know, came up with the revelation by God that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said, upon this rock shall I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. You know, the gates of hell are always resisting the moves of God. I remember, you know, reading um, the great prayer, prayer, the great adventure by... David Jeremiah. And you know, he tackles that issue so well. And it gives a story about a certain missionary who was in a, some, some certain part you know, of the world. I can't remember quite well. Uh, uh, you know, and he says, you know, there is this church that, was, that had sent you know, a missionary somewhere. And uh, this was a medical missionary, by the way. And so from where they used you know, to, to, to where the mission was, when they, whenever they ran out of supplies, they'll go through a forest, mm -hmm. go to the, uh, you know, the nearest, uh, to, to the shopping center, that is a, a day's journey, and in coming back, most of them would sleep in the woods or in the forest. And so one day this, uh, this guy goes and uh, he gets the, the resources or whatever they need, and then on his way back, the nightfall comes, and so he has to, to come somewhere and sleep. I know this was the habit, that those, mm -hmm. People in that town, they had a habit of uh, seeing these missionaries come and they know at a certain hour, if this person begins his journey back, they'll not reach, you know, to their mission center to where they, they are going. And so they laid an ambush. They followed this guy until the place where he went to sleep and they waited until, he, you know, he was, he, was, he was knocked out in sleep. This missionary, of course, prayed and he was asleep. And so... So this mission is the one who's giving, you know, the testimony in his church. And he says, you know, that day he woke up in the morning, all everything was intact. He went to the mission. And the next week, as usual, he goes, he goes back, you know, to the same market, you know, to buy some supplies. And when he gets there, he finds these people waiting for him. And, and, and they stop him and, they, you know, they start having this conversation. And when having that conversation, these people tell this man, we don't know about you, but the God that you serve, we want to know him. Yes, why? He said, you don't know. The day you came here, we knew you'll not reach, you know, uh, the, uh, you'll not go through the forest, you, you will rest there. So we followed you so that when you sleep, we can come and rob you. So the missionary is giving this story in his church. And he says, do you know what? These people said, when we came waiting for you to sleep, when we were about to attack you, we saw 26 soldiers protecting you. So we could not... We could, we could not come, you know, against you. And so when that person is just talking like that, one of the members of the church just stands up and he says, stop. He quotes that day. That very day when that person, you know, it was day, daytime, uh, you know, in, the, uh, in states where this person is giving the testimony. And he's saying that day, I want those people that, 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 that I called to pray with me to stand up. And every one of those men stood up. They were 26 in number. They were 26 in number. And this guy says, I was just going out to play golf, but I felt an imprint in my heart to pray for this missionary. And so he called 26 brothers and they all took up the, the, the hour to pray. And you see, right there in the forest, when it's at night on the other side of the world, 26 soldiers are standing guard. Praise be the name of the living God. Missionaries need prayers. I repeat, missionaries need prayers. We pastors need prayers. Some of you have taken time to labor and to accuse servants of God and you've taken time to pray for them. Take some time and pray for the people that God has called to serve in this vineyard at this time as at this. Amen. Instead of complaining, instead of bragging, instead of pointing out on mistakes, 
Get on your knees and pray for the servants of God. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and it's the violent that take it by force. Remember, the gates of hell shall not prevail because there is a man and a woman like you and me who are standing in the gap and bringing the servants of God who are bearing the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Amen. We've come to the end of the 46th book of the Bible. Tomorrow we begin on the second episode of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinthians. That is the second book of Corinthians. I pray this. May you become a prayer warrior. May you, those of you who are, who are in this ministry, pray for me as a pastor. Pray for your leaders. Pray for those who labor for your sake. Why? Because a great and effective door has, has, has opened, but there are very many adversaries. Remember, the enemy does not just sit around. He's stopping the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from being preached. All the scandals you see of the servants of God, it is the enemy trying to stop those people from doing the mandate that God called them to do. And if you pray, most of them will be kept strong. Praise be the name of the living God. So see you tomorrow as we begin the 47th book of the Bible. That is the second episode of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. May the Lord watch over you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine towards you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. I pray may open doors be your portion. I pray may divine favor be your portion. May the grace that makes men diligent gent and be distinguished fall upon you today in Jesus mighty name see you tomorrow shalom